Chapter 9 of Acts is, I think, a pivotal chapter uh, in the book of Acts and in our understanding of the Christian life and faith. At the opening of chapter 9, we are told about a Pharisee named Saul who goes with the blessing of the Jewish council in Jerusalem to find all the people in Damascus who are worshiping Jesus, worshiping as part of the way. And while he's on his way to arrest all of those followers of Jesus that he can find, he is, he is thrown from his donkey uh, and meets Jesus in person. And thus, Saul becomes Paul, St. Paul, the one who has written most of the New Testament, the one who has converted the Gentiles, the non-Jews, to believe and come to faith in Jesus Christ. But at the end of chapter 9, there's this really strange turn of events, and suddenly the author, the author of the text, stops talking about Paul and starts talking about Peter, these two miracles that Peter performs. So in the first miracle, Peter uh, is in Lydda, and while he's there, there is, he meets a man who is paralyzed. And reminiscent of what Jesus does, he says to the paralyzed man, pick up your mat and walk. And the man gets up from his place. You see, Peter, the one who was the denier of Jesus and who left him alone to die on the cross, now has become the one who bears witness to the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. So listen now to the second miracle that takes place just a short time later. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the, upper, to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body, and he said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I sat in a hospital room, which I had done many, many times over the course of my ministry. And I sat with a large group of people in one of those small ICU rooms. Many of you know what I'm talking about. As we sat there, the silence was punctuated from time to time by the beeping of life support. Doctors and nurses walked in and out. And finally, there was that conversation that nobody really ever wants to have. When the conversation was over and decisions were made, we all stood up and we held hands and we prayed. At the end of the prayer, someone started talking about a childhood memory. And then a grandchild started talking about a vacation that he remembered so vividly. And in this place, we all started to laugh. And then we all started to cry. When we sat down, all I could think of is, how could this be happening? It just didn't make any sense to me. And it didn't make sense to anybody else in the room either. 
And as we sat there waiting for what was inevitably going to happen, the ventilator seemed very loud in my ears. You know that sound of breathing, mechanical breathing in and out and in and out. And I started to recognize that I myself was breathing with the ventilator. And suddenly I heard these words, these words from Genesis. And God breathed over the face of the deep and brought forth life. And the power of the Holy Spirit was in that place. And I suddenly began to realize that this was not really a place of death because signs of life were in that space. Because if God could speak to the chaos at the very beginning of time and bring forth life, God could speak into this chaos and remind us that where the presence of God's spirit is, there is always life. The people in Joppa, had just experienced their own version of the hospital room as they washed and prepared Tabitha's body for burial. It was a place of deep sadness for them, and they didn't know what to do. Here was a community that prayed together, that rejoiced together, and that wept together. And in those moments, their community found itself to be in chaos. And so they did the only thing that they knew to do, and that was to send some of those disciples of Jesus to find Peter, who was about a half a day's journey away. And I wondered in my mind, why would they go after Tabitha died to find Peter. And I believe it's simple. I believe the only reason they sent him was because they believed that God was going to perform a miracle through Peter for them in those days. There was no other reason to send Peter after Tabitha had already died. They knew that somehow God would be present to them in the midst of their chaos and their grief. And so they went. Now, what's really interesting to me in the reading of this particular text and in the midst of all the other things that are going on and all the details they give here is that Tabitha is held up as someone who is of special value and worth. The problem is, is that throughout the scripture, there are women who perform charitable acts that are very similar to what she does from the Old Testament through the New Testament. There are women who are unnamed, who over and over again continue to work faithfully for God, for the community, so that they might bear witness to the thing that is greater than themselves. And as I've said before, so I won't belabor this point, names have special meaning in the scripture. Not all names, but a lot of names have special meaning in the scripture. For instance, if we talk about Adam in Genesis, Adam really means earth or dirt. Abraham is the father of nations. That's what his name means. Jacob is Israel. Jesus comes from the Jewish word Yeshua, which means Yahweh or God saves. Peter is the rock, the rock that the church will be built on. So Tabitha, obviously because she's named, must have some special meaning behind her name. And she's not only named once, but she's named twice. Tabitha is her Greek, her Jewish name, and Dorcas is her Greek name, her Gentile name, non-Jewish 
name. She had to be pretty extraordinary to have two names in the scripture. We know that she had exuded compassion and mercy on the most vulnerable people in her community, the widows. The widows were people who were often the poorest in their community because they had no male heir or husband to take care of them. They had no work that was of value to the community. They were usually left alone and they were the most lonely people in their community, often on the streets and homeless. And she somehow decided that these women were worthy of her time and her attention, and so she made them clothing. But what does her name mean? And why would it be named twice? Well, Tabitha simply means, literally, gazelle. Not mother of nations, not God saves, not heart of compassion, gazelle. And a gazelle, as most of you know, is nothing more than an antelope. <laughs> there is even a Dorcas gazelle. Some of you may have seen them in a zoo or on a trip that you took somewhere. But gazelles are known for their gentleness their steadiness, and their lack of fear. Some might actually call that naive. Many of them die because of that. This gazelle, I believe, impacted so many lives that she was worthy of her name being mentioned not once but twice. Because you see, what I believe is that this gazelle, this Tabitha, this Dorcas crossed lines that had previously not been crossed. She was the one who took care of widows. But could it be that she didn't just take care of the widows who were believers in Jesus? Could it be that she not only took care of the widows who were Jewish? Could it be that this woman took care of non-believers as well? Could it be that she stretched across the boundaries that were culturally acceptable and reached out into the Greek community and the pagan community and took care of their widows as well, which is why her Greek name becomes so important in the story? Perhaps. Perhaps she opened the way for us to reach beyond what is most comfortable into what is most uncomfortable for all of us. At the time when Peter gets back to see this gazelle, he finds what would typically be a funeral gathering. There are mourners in the room they're sad, they're crying, they're believers. They're showing Peter the tunics th that Tabitha had made for them. And in the moments of that, Peter looks at her, and certainly in his head there is a flashback to Jesus. He makes everybody leave the room, and he surely is recalling the day that Jesus raised the little girl of Jairus, the Roman centurion, from the dead. He gets on his knees and he begins to pray. And in those moments on his knees, he must hear the voice of God saying, it is time. And he looks at her and he says to her, Tabitha, get up. Years earlier, Jesus had said to Jairus' daughter, Talitha Kume, little girl, get up. And she does. And like Jesus, Peter extends a hand and he lifts her out of the bed and he calls in the community of faith to bear witness one more time to the, an act of God that is unimaginable. And many people in Joppa came to believe. 
Is it possible that who believed were not just the Jews, but the Gentiles who knew Dorcas as well? I think Dorcas opens the way for all people to begin to have faith in Jesus Christ. And we could end right here, right now, and we can say that this is all the story is about. The story is about a woman who's been raised from the dead and Peter who is now faithful to Jesus in all he does and, and in all he says. But that's not really what the scripture is about, at least not really what it's about when you start to look at all the possibilities and things that could happen here. You see, what I hear is that there is a community of faith that sees that there is much more to God, to this faith in Christ that can meet the eye. It's much more than someone being raised from the dead. You see, we need to understand that in this place, it was because of the community of faith that this woman came back to life. It was the community of faith that had so much belief and so much commitment to their faith that they were willing to send two people out to go get the disciple even after she had passed. It was the community of faith that bore witness to this woman's compassion and grace and mercy. It was this community of faith that prepared her body for burial, as was the custom. It was this community of faith that said, our understanding of birth and life and death is not enough because God's way of birth and life and death is so much more. This is the story about divine life that breaks beyond the boundaries of what we know and what we can understand and offers new life and new hope. Here we have the story of not one resurrection, but many resurrections. Here we have a faith community that begins to understand that their faith is not limited by what they see and what they do and what they say. Because they begin to understand that as a community of faith, they worship the one true God who has power that they have not even begun to understand or to tap into. They are one people with one vision, with one God. And because of that, they have one hope that is stronger than anything else that they can put their hands on. Now, I believe that resurrections happen in our world and in our day all the time. And I believe that every single resurrection has its own story to tell. But I also believe that every single resurrection happens in the context of the community that undergirds that resurrection. In resurrection, there is love and there is hope and there is grace. And all of those things are signs of life that abound in ways that we cannot articulate over and over again. But yet without the community, there can be no resurrection because it is in the sense that we are all one in Christ Jesus in our baptisms, that resurrection happens. And it's not hard to help someone move from death to life. We tend to complicate things in our world and in our lives. But what if for one, one moment, you saw a homeless person on the street maybe as you were driving downtown and they were standing on the corner where your traffic light is. And instead of handing them money, you looked at them in the eye. You didn't turn your face away. And you just greeted them. We avoid that most of the time. What would it be like to greet the stranger on the corner? Would they know that they had value? 
in that moment? Could you be the person who begins the resurrection? Could I be the person who begins the resurrection of someone else? Listening, the lost art of listening to the people around us, could they rediscover their value because we spent the time to listen to someone? Would they understand that they were more than just flesh and blood, but that they were actually children of God? Would their dignity be restored? Would their hope be restored? Would there be signs of life, not just for the moment, but forever? A few weeks ago, there was a group of people who went to the mosque in Plano. What would it be like to be in relationship with people who we purposefully avoid? With the people that we choose not to speak to? With the people that we have already labeled and judged? Signs of life abound in those moments, and resurrection happens. Just this past Thursday, I had the privilege of um, meeting with a group of residents at Emily's Place, and most of you here know that Emily's Place is transitional housing for women and children who have come out of domestic violence, and they're trying to get their lives back together. I sat at a table with these women and heard their stories and shared my story. We talked about the Bible study that we're going to be doing, and we prayed together, and we talked about their children and my children. And in those moments, I recognized that in the face of death, these women chose life, not just for themselves, but for their kids. And while I understood around that table that what I had experienced was resurrection of their lives, it could not have been complete because as I walked outside to talk to some of the volunteers that were standing there, there were their children in the backyard running and playing and laughing and squealing. And there were volunteers that were chasing them all around and I realized in those moments that the vision of God's heaven on earth had come to that place. And resurrection, which was, I thought, only for them, was for me. You see, this was a story that was unfolding before my eyes of something that was miraculous that was breaking outside of the norms of our acceptance, that said in the place of death, there can be life, full and abundant. This was not about one resurrection, but about many resurrections. This wasn't about one person creating a resurrection moment. This was about a community of faith that had come together with one, under one God, with one hope, with one vision. And resurrections were all around us. And everybody there was part of the resurrection. This was life in the face of death. Something that we often don't think much about or look for. And the paradox of all of this is that in those moments, in those moments where we think that we are the ones that are bringing something to someone, we are the recipients of grace. We are the ones whose hearts are broken open. We are the ones who are resurrected from our one way of thinking to another whole understanding of what it means to be a child of God. We have in us the power of resurrection 
the resurrection that works in us and through us so that others might know that they are children of God, that they have value and they have worth. And that's not just for our own good, but it's for the good of the world we live in. So this week, this month, this year, will we hoard the gift that we have been given? Or will we share the momentary resurrections that we carry in us so that others might know? So that we might not just be known by our given names, but by the name that God calls us. Will we move beyond what is most comfortable, what is most familiar, what is accepted as the norm? Will we be Dorcas in the days to come?